Hi, welcome to the Unit 6.2 Kinetic Video. This is part one of two. In 6.1, we learn what kinetics is, which is the study of reaction rates. So that would include like how fast or slow a chemical reaction is. We also looked at the factors that control reaction rates. That includes surface area of a solid, the concentration or pressure of a reactant, the temperature, and the presence or absence of a catalyst. We also talked about how we quantify reaction rates, and there are two main ways. One, we could uh, determine the average or non-instantaneous rate, and that's done by measuring the change in the concentration of reactant or product over an interval of time. One thing to note is if we're measuring the change in the concentration of the reactant, because the concentration of the reaction reactant decreases over time, that we'll need to multiply that value by negative one to make sure that the rate stays positive. The other um, quantity of uh, way we can quantify rate is through an instantaneous rate. And so that's, at, that's the rate at a particular time. And that is measured um, as the derivative of the curve, which can be determined by taking the slope of the line tangent to the curve at that time. Once again, if you are doing this for the curve of the um, the react the rate curve for the reactant, you want to make sure you multiply that by negative one because the concentration of reactant will decrease, and you want to keep that rate positive. The next thing we looked at was determining rate loss, um, and the the method the first method we looked at um, is the method of initial rates. So. Here's an example of a rate law for the reaction of ammonium and nitrate. The rate law is equal to the rate constant K times the reactants raised to their rate orders. Now it's important to note that these rate orders, which in this case are X and Y, are not the same thing as the coefficients in the balance equation. They are not the coefficients in the balance equation. So how do we determine the rate orders? They must be determined, once again, experimentally. And in a case with initial rates, what you would do is you would sort of use, um, you would use the ideas behind systems of equations in math to sort of eliminate some variables. For example, if you wanted to find X, which is the rate order with respect to NH4 plus or ammonium, you want to find two experiments where the concentration of ammonium changes, but the concentration of the other reactant stays the same. And in that way, you allow um, the variable Y to be canceled out. And those two experiments will be experiment two and three. And as you can see in each experiment, you the you have the you're given the rate for different initial concentration of both reactants. Okay, so once we take experiment two and three, we can see that we can determine the scalar factor for um, the concentration of NH4 plus and for the rate, and we can see from determine from there that the rate order with respect to NH4 plus will be one. We can do the same thing for NO2 minus. In this case, we want two experiments where the initial concentration of NH4 plus are the same and that of NO2 minus are, is different. And once we do that, that's experiment one and two, we can again use the scalar factors to sort of help us determine the rate orders. And in that case also, the rate order for NO2 minus is also one. Now you may notice that the rate orders are the same as the coefficients, but that's a coincidence because remember, these values are not the coefficients. Once you have the rate orders, now you can choose any experiment to plug in um, for concentrations to determine your K. And you would plug in your concentrations, you plug in your rate, and then in this case, you could get K to be, uh, we would get K to be 2.7 times 10 to the minus five. And it's important to note here, we have these units, um, and units are super important. All right, so how do we determine the rate law from um, a plot? That's the second method that we're going to, to, to look at. So before we begin, let's talk about how we conduct uh, a rate experiment. Let's say you have a reaction A going to B, and reactant A is this blue substance, and the product B is this colorless substance. So what you can do is you can measure the change in the concentration of A um, over time. So as A reacts, it's going to disappear, so you get less and less of A, and you can see here in these vials that the um, solution is becoming less and less blue because you have less and less A. So you have, the, you have your time and you have your concentration uh, um, of A at those, at those times. 
Now that information can be used to determine the rate, of course, right? So remember, rate is will be the could be determined as a change in the concentration of A over the change in the constant over the change in time, and so you could easily determine that from um, a table like this, where you have the time on the x-axis and the concentration of A on the y. You can also plot, plot that data in an actual xy coordinate. And once again, you can use that to determine either the um, average rate or in this case, or you can also use it to turn the instantaneous rates. And once you have a plot, you can measure the tangent. All right. So you may be thinking, OK, that's all well and good. Like I could easily determine concentrations of A at various times. But wait a second. How exactly do I get these values for concentration? So kind of seems strange because in order to, what we know about concentration is it's equal to moles over liters. Molarity is equal to moles over liters. Well, how exactly would you get the moles of A and the liters of solution? Like the moles of A is going to change over time. And since we don't know the rate yet, like we wouldn't be able to determine that. What exactly do we do? Well, what we do is we use a spectrophotometer. So the way that a spectrophotometer works is, um, you have a light source and that light source will break down the light into different wavelengths of light. So a wavelength of light is light at a certain energy. And you probably already know this from looking at a rainbow, Roy G. Biv, where um, red light has a longer wavelength or lower energy and um, violet light has a high, higher wavelength or um, sorry, a smaller wavelength or higher energy. And depending on the substance, the um, it will absorb different wavelengths of light differently. So in a substance that's blue, it's going to absorb a lot more in the um, orange, yellow-ish region. So what we can do is we can adjust this slit so that the only wavelength of light that's coming through is this yellow light. So now we have this yellow light that's coming into our sample. And since our sample is going to absorb some of it, the light that, um, the intensity of light, so IO, that is hitting the sample is going to be a lot stronger than that that's coming out because we have absorbed some of it. So the intensity of light that's coming out is going to be less. <clears throat> and then what we can do is we can sort of take a ratio of these two, two lights, and that's how we can measure the um, absorbance. And that's known as the Beers-Lambert law. So the absorbance really is just determining for this given wavelength of light, in this case, a yellow a light that corresponds to a yellow wavelength, how much light was absorbed by our sample. And if you use a spectrophotometer, you can get, so you sort of get a plot that looks somewhat like this, where you'll notice that there is a sort of a peak here. And this peak sort of measures um, where the most, where the light has been absorbed the most. And in this sample here, it's been absorbed the most at um, 650 nanometers. OK, um, <clears throat> so, well, how does that relate to uh, concentration? Well, it relates to concentration through this equation. Absorbance equals B, which is path length, times absorptivity, molar absorptivity, times concentration. So let's go through these terms um, in individually and talk about their units. Starting with absorbance. So we already know absorbance is how much um, light the substance absorb, and that's a unitless value. B is the path length, and that um, I, is measured in either centimeters, millimeters, et cetera, any unit of length. So how do we measure the path length? I just want to show you how we measure that. That um, is determined by the cuvette, or which is what you use to hold your substance inside a spectrophotometer. And it will actually say on the cuvette if it's in millimeters or centimeters or whatever. It'll tell you the value, like one centimeter, two millimeters, et cetera. So the path length will be given to you from the cuvette that you use. The next is the absorptivity. Um, and the units of the absorptivity are such that, that they're designed to um, make sure absorbance is unitless. So it'll be one over whatever unit you use for concentration times whatever unit was used for um, length. So let's talk about what absorbance is. Different substances absor absorb light at specific wavelengths differently. So um, the molar absorptivity, also known as the extension coefficient, quantifies how well a substance absorbs light at a particular wavelength. Um, the higher the absorptivity, the molar absorptivity, 
the more the substance will absorb light at that wavelength. An example of that would be just regular black paint and what's known as Vanta black paint. And as you can see here, the Vanta black paint is clearly absorbing more light. You don't see much light being reflected um, than the regular black paint. So the molar absorptivity of the Vanta black would be a lot higher than the black paint. Now, the, the extension coefficient or molar absorptivity must be determined experimentally. And the way that that's done is you would measure the absorbance of that substance at different concentrations. Um, so you have different concentrations here on the x-axis and then the absorbance that you get, um, that, you, that you determine for that substance, and then you would plot it. And the slope of this line would be the molar absorptivity. Okay, so the molar absorptivity um, is can be determined again, once again, experimentally. And then the last one is the concentration, which is what you would probably be looking for. So, and that's measured in molarity or units of molar. All right, so let's take a look at this first, this CFU. What is the concentration of a blue dye if the path length is one centimeter, molar absorptivity is um, 8,400 per molar centimeter? Pause the video now and you press play again, a hint will be given to you. Okay, so here's the hint. I want you to, um, first off, underline the key information. You're given the path length, you're given the molar absorptivity. And then take a look at the plot over on the uh, side here. You're also given the absorbance. So you wanna find the peak or the, the highest peak and you use that to measure the absorbance. Um, once you have that, you can plug that into the equation and then solve for, your, for C, your concentration. After you solve it, press play again, the answer will be revealed. Okay, so here's the work. Plugged in my absorbance, my path length, and my molar absorptivity. Use that to solve for my concentration. I got the concentration to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. All right, that's it for part um, one. We're going to move on to part two now. Hope you found this video helpful. Have a quality day.